Today on Christian World News, the beginning of the end. The U.S. starts pulling troops out of Afghanistan. Who's waiting to fill the vacuum and what could it mean for religious freedom? Plus, a Japanese church washed away in the tsunami, reborn in a coffee shop? This pastor says it's all part of God's plan. And crossing cultures, a Korean Christian puts down roots in Paraguay. Now he's giving these kids a shot at a better life. Welcome everyone to Christian World News. I'm Wendy Griffith. George Thomas is on assignment. This week, U.S. President Obama announced the first drawdown of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Some question if the U.S. is pulling out too soon. Among them are religious rights groups who say Afghanistan still has a long way to go in guaranteeing religious freedom. It's especially harsh for Christians. Afghans who leave Islam to follow Christ have been jailed and threatened with the death sentence. It could get worse if the Taliban comes to power. In 2010, the Taliban murdered 10 members of a Christian aid team providing medical treatment to villagers in northern Afghanistan. And in 2007, the group kidnapped 23 Christian Korean missionaries, murdering two of them before releasing the rest. Joining us now is Knox Thames, Policy Director for the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. The group advises the U.S. State Department on religious freedom issues worldwide, and he's just back from Afghanistan. Knox, it seems like there's hardly any religious freedom in Afghanistan today. Will it just get worse when the U.S. pulls out? Well, that's a great question, and that's something that we're very concerned about. And it's critical that the U.S. government as it's looking towards 2014, works to establish safeguards uh, that the Afghan government will respect for the, for the religious freedoms of all Afghanis, be they Christians, Hindus, uh, Sunni or Shia Muslims. If the Taliban were to ever come back to power, it would have devastating consequences for really all Afghanis of any faith, but especially for minority religious communities. Knox, the Afghan constitution, believe it or, believe it or not, guarantees religious freedom. So, you know, why aren't we seeing that put into practice? Well, the Afghan constitution, the way it was drafted, has, has a conflict inside its, the very articles that make up the, the text. While it does have language that uh, commits the Afghan government to respect the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it also has provisions that say nothing can uh, go against Sharia law. And the problem facing Afghanistan now is, what is Sharia law? Is it the version that the Taliban uh, forced onto the populace, or is it a more moderate, progressive version that we see in other countries around the world? Well, last time I checked, Sharia law and uh, freedom of religion don't mix at all. Well, we've certainly seen examples where uh, very regressive interpretations have led to severe religious freedom abuses for Christians and other minorities, but also even for Muslims, that it, it prevents uh, hmm. Muslims to debate their own faith and have an open discussion about what with how to interpret the tenets of their faith. What should the U.S. government be doing to encourage religious freedom in Afghanistan? Well, it needs to be put this on top of the, the agenda. Uh, as we're looking to transition authority and responsibility to the Afghanis, we need to make sure that they understand the importance of religious freedom, the importance of creating space in their society for peaceful religious dialogue, that um, they also they understand the importance of tolerance, that just because you're of a different faith, different ethnicity, that doesn't mean you're, you're of less value and that you have just as many rights as any other Afghan citizen. So we need to be putting this on top of the agenda and raising it at the highest levels in Kabul. And Knox, what's the big picture here? Why is religious freedom so crucial to democracy? Well, without it, you know, religious freedom is a unique human, human right in that it stands atop other human rights. Mm -hmm. So if you have religious freedom, you also have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. And we've seen where there isn't religious freedom, those rights are also not respected and women's rights are also abused. Um, so if you want to have a flourishing democracy that's, that's growing forward, that's moving the country forward, you've got to have uh, fundamental rights like religious freedom fully respected for all. Okay, but what's the reality? What's really going to happen if the Taliban comes back to power? Oh, it'd be horrible. It'd be, it would be devastating um, for the Afghan citizens, also for our foreign policy in the region. Um, as we know, the Taliban were uh, allowed terrorist attacks to be launched from their soil. And uh, if they were to come back into power, we would have to assume that they would 
uh, rebuild those liaisons and again try to establish those goals. So we must do everything we can to ensure that that, that, that day doesn't come. Mm. And um, putting human rights and religious freedom at the top of the agenda, making sure that the Constitution, the Afghan Constitution is interpreted in such a way that religious freedoms are protected and respected will go a long way to help uh, create yeah. the safeguards that will prevent that, that day from ever coming again. And they certainly need our prayers for that. Well, Knox Thames, we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The ongoing NATO campaign to oust Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi is now in its third month. Libya is a mostly Muslim nation, but there is a small Christian community there. As international correspondent Gary Lane tells us, they're hoping for another kind of freedom. Here's Gary from Libya. We've had the opportunity to talk to many Libyans here in the eastern part of the country, and they're determined that they will defeat Muammar Gaddafi. They're glad that they're now free in this part of the country. But what about the Christians? Have they been free? Yes, there is a small Christian community here. There are some Muslim background believers. They're too frightened uh, to talk to us on camera. But we did talk to one woman off camera. She was the wife of a sheikh, a Muslim priest. And she told us that if she were to have a Bible and be in public with that Bible, that she would certainly be arrested. And her husband did not know she was a Christian. Her children also became Christians through watching satellite television. You see satellite dishes throughout the country here. But the largest number of Christians here in Libya are from the expats, from the foreign workers that come here. Most of them are Egyptian. And we had the opportunity to meet with some Coptic Christians and to visit them in one of their services. And they told us they're freer here than they would be in Egypt. In Libya, more better than in Egypt. Is the Egyptian Christian in Egypt uh, in a bad manner now? Are you worried? I'm not worried because God with us. If God be with us, who is against us? We traveled throughout North Africa and Tunisia, Libya, and also Egypt. We'll have many crucial reports for you to see in the days ahead. I'm Gary Lane from Derna, Libya. Up next. I regret that I was not able to reach out to our neighbors, and now most of them are gone. Out of the rubble of the Japanese tsunami, a new church is born. CWNews.org, your constant news source on the World Wide Web. Find daily updates on the global church. Watch the weekly broadcast. Three former presidents come together to honor the life and ministry. Also available in podcast. The in-depth insights into our reporter blogs. Taliban kidnapped at least 18 in South Peru, Korean Christians. Of your online news source for complete coverage of the global church. Our world moves at an incredible pace. People everywhere rushing to their destinations. But there's a destiny that awaits each one of us. And all of us will face life's ultimate question. Where will I spend eternity? In his new DVD, Life Beyond the Grave, Pat Robertson introduces you to real people with remarkable stories of heaven and riveting accounts of hell. You'll learn what the Bible has to say about life after death. The Bible tells us that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Life Beyond the Grave will build your faith as God's promises come alive, prepare you to face your eternity, and provide you with a powerful witnessing tool to share with your loved ones. I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your destiny is sealed forever in heaven. What touched my heart was when the little boy was able to see his great grandfather in heaven. It gave me chills. It just gives me goosebumps. <laughs> Make you decide which side of the street you need to walk on. The stories are true. They're real people with real life experiences. Makes you really want to get to heaven. It's beautiful and awe-inspiring and very encouraging. Each and every person should watch this DVD. Life Beyond the Grave, available now. When the tsunami hit Japan, it swept away entire towns, including a number of churches. However, some are finding a new location and a new ministry in the wake of the disaster. Asia correspondent Lucille Toulousen reports from Sendai, Japan. The tsunami flattened coastal villages like this one in Sendai. 
Thousands of its residents swept into the sea. Three months have passed and this area still needs a lot of cleaning. Actually, there still is a stench of dead bodies. I cannot imagine how the families or the parents tried to save their children. Here you see a stuffed toy, school supplies of uh, children. As much as the families would want to come back here to live again, the residents are rethinking whether they should come back and rebuild their houses in this place. The Seaside Bible Chapel was not spared from the tsunami's powerful wave. The church is totally gone, along with Pastor Naito's house. Buried in the rubble, Naito and his family found a church sign. Noah is Pastor Naito's son. I spent five years of my life in this place. I lost everything in the tsunami, but I realized the things I concentrated on was worthless. I regret that I was not able to reach out to our neighbors, and now most of them are gone. The church had only 30 members, but small churches are typical for Japan. And this is because most people are Buddhist and Shintoists. Plus, Japanese are very private people. They are not fond of joining large communities like Christian churches. However, the disasters on March 11 are giving Christians opportunities to share God's love with the victims. Japan has always been a difficult place uh, to share the gospel. The Japanese have everything, but what they've always lacked is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jonathan Wilson is the Director of Christian Relief Assistance, Support and Hope in Japan. CRAS Japan is a network of Japanese and international Christian groups. We're finding as we send teams into shelters and wash people's feet or massage their hands uh, and listen to their stories and pray with them that hearts are open like never before. Crash teams work alongside local government officials who see the value of their efforts. I thank the organization for helping our town. They bring unity to the communities and hope for our people. Crash also helps churches like Seaside Bible Chapel rise again. The congregation now meets in a coffee shop provided by the organization. Before the tsunami, our church was located 700 meters from the coastline, and it was quite an empty place. But now we are in a good place where a lot of people go, and so there's a better chance to share the gospel more. It's all part of God's plan. A cross that was dug from the ruins is now erected where the Seaside Bible Chapel used to stand, as a symbol of hope and a reminder that when everything else is gone, only one thing prevails. We don't need anything except God. We only need our faith in Him, nothing more. Lucille Talusen, CBN News, Miyagi, Japan. Great story. Thanks so much, Lucille. Turning now to South America, thousands of tribal people in Paraguay, driven from their traditional homelands, are living in deep poverty. Their plight is made worse because they don't speak the national language and don't blend in. So when a Korean missionary decided to give these tribal children a better future, their leaders welcomed him with open arms. Our correspondent Carolina Martinez reports from Asuncion. Christian schools for the indigenous people of Paraguay during 2011. They hope to build over 90 more schools in the next 10 years. It all began with a conversation between a Korean evangelical pastor and missionary in Paraguay and an indigenous chief. Francisco. Chief Francisco said to me as I was leaving the community, Pastor Diego, I'm asking you to please come back here and preach the gospel to our community. If you come and preach the gospel, then our children's future will change. Pastor Diego Young and his congregation in Asuncion have over 20 years of experience in the education field. They have a school with over 300 students. Many of them learn of the Christian faith for the first time at the school. The school's Christian teaching has transformed the lives of hundreds of families so far, and now thanks to donations from a Presbyterian church in Korea and the help of other churches and organizations, they are responding to the need of the indigenous tribes in Paraguay. I'm also looking for several Christian programs, not just building a classroom. That's only a part of the project, because infrastructure does not change the person. 
so we're looking for teams rather than bricks. According to the latest census, there are 108,000 indigenous people in Paraguay. So far, the Ministry of Education has 310 rural schools for the indigenous people, but they are very small and have few resources. Only 50 percent of all indigenous children attend primary school, and only 1 percent go on to college. Dionisio is part of that 1 percent, and thanks to the Christian education he received through Pastor Young's ministry, he is now an agent of change in his community. After you convert or are born again and become a Christian, you change so much. We got to know God. We studied the Bible, my family, my community. After knowing God, we completely changed. This ministry has also the permanent support of dozens of young volunteers who come from different parts of the world. When you come to Paraguay and begin working with children, young people, and you do all this social work that you never imagined you would do in your life, you can really feel that blessing and that sense that God is at work. The Embrace the Future project will not only build schools and provide education to children, it will also work hand-in-hand -hand with another project of Pastor Diego Young, which is already underway, a training and evangelism school for the indigenous chiefs across the country. There they learn agriculture, beekeeping, they receive work tools, but they also learn the word of God in their own language, Guarani. In Asuncion, Paraguay, Carolina Martinez, CBN News. When Christian World News returns, touching the untouchables, how this writer made a missions trip to India and got a novel idea. We asked CBN.com users how we could make our website easier to use, and we listened. This is really easy to read and move through. The information opens up a whole lot quicker. Yeah, yeah it's much faster. There's everything I'm interested in right here. The click of a mouse. The new CBN.com has been redesigned, making it faster to find your favorite 700 Club stories, musical guests, or online community with special features. Anyone can enjoy this new site. Visit the new CBN.com today. Here at CBN, we see amazing things happen when we stand together. That's why we want to say thank you to the thousands of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club. Your monthly gift makes it possible to bring crucial help to those who need it most. You help heal the sick, feed the hungry, and preach the gospel across America and throughout the world. You've brought health and hope to people in desperate need. And changed their lives forever. When Kitty was abandoned by her parents, she went to live with her grandmother in the middle of a garbage dump. They ate scraps of food from the dump and tried not to get bitten by the rats. That's when you built them a new home and set up a small clothing business near the market for Kitty's grandmother. You rescued them from hunger and fear. So please, watch for this mailing and send in your pledge. This year, millions will know the love and saving power of Jesus Christ. And that only happens because you were there. Is there life after death? And I began to rise out of my body up into that room. Are heaven and hell real places? I can see fields, crystal clear river, trees along both sides. What determines where I go when I die? I knew that the first person I saw was Jesus. Discover the answers to life's most important questions in the 700 Club's Life Beyond the Grave. Real stories from the 700 Club. Available now. Randy Singer is a practicing trial lawyer who also pastors a church on the weekends. But in his spare time, he writes legal thrillers. His latest novel is called False Witness. The plot includes some of his experiences from a recent missions trip to India. He spoke with George Thomas about what he saw there. I first went to India a couple of years ago, and I was just blown away by my experience there, George. I, I felt like I stepped back into the book of Acts mm. because there are miracles happening. There are massive numbers of conversions, people coming to Christ, but there's incredible needs as well and persecution there. And so just having been touched by that experience, I thought I need to kind of weave that into one of my stories because I think a lot of Western Christians, a lot of folks in America don't know some of the incredible challenges the church is facing there. 
there. There's one particular group of people that perhaps our viewers are not uh, familiar with. They're called the the untouchables. In essence, they are the lowest of the lowest in the Indian culture. They're also called uh, uh, Dalits. Your visit to India had uh, an impact on your life as it relates to this particular group of people. Tell us about that. Right. Well, you know, as a lawyer, I'm looking for places where the gospel and human rights converge. And the Dalits in India, they, as you said, they used to be called the untouchables. There's more than 165 million of them. Most of them live in poverty. Only two or three percent of Dalit women know how to read and write. And as I was talking to the leaders over there for years, the Dalits have been told, you're not, you're not even worth what an animal's worth. Mm. You know, a dog can go into a temple, but not a Dalit. And even though in India the laws have changed so that they now have equality, it, the leader told me it takes two generations to get out of oppression or slavery. The first generation changes the laws, but the second generation changes the mindset. Mm. And when you go to these, these schools for, for Dalits, these English speaking schools sponsored by folks like the Dalit Freedom Network, and you see these little children, their big smiles and their bright eyes, mm. you know, and you think, what can I do to help them have opportunity in life, to realize that there's, there's freedom in Christ, but that other people care about them and they are worthy of Christ dying for them. As you know, there is this uh, thing called the caste system in India that really has held millions of Indians in bondage as a result of this right. system. There is uh, numerous uh, organizations out there helping the Dalits, but there's one in particular called the Dalit Freedom Network, one of the grassroots, really a, a vital part of the Indian society when it comes to reaching out and ministering to the Dalit uh, community. Tell us about the DFN. Yeah, I love supporting the Dalit Freedom Network. In fact, all the proceeds from False Witness, my latest legal thriller, are going to the Dalit Freedom Network. I tell my readers at the end of the book, I've never asked you as readers to do anything, but I'm asking now, mm -hmm. would you go to the Dalit Freedom Network and for $28 a month, you can support a child in their school needs and their health needs because money goes an incredibly long Long way in India. But not only that, the Dalit Freedom Network works with this issue of human trafficking, which is huge in India, as you probably know. It's the number one source and destination nation. There are millions of young Indian girls that get caught up in this. There's more than 12 uh, million children who are in ch child bonded labor. Uh, the, the Indian government has even done a study that shows that most of the girls in human trafficking are between the ages of 11 and 14. Mm. Uh, there's a concept in that you mentioned the Hindu religion in, in some areas like Karnataka has 100,000 Devadasis, which are basically you quote unquote marry the temple. Mm -hmm. But this, this family in the community says, our oldest daughter, we're going we're gonna to dedicate to the temple and they become temple prostitutes. And then when they're in their 30s, the priests, you know, put them out on the street. And so there's all these human trafficking issues and the Dalit Freedom Network is working with those as well. And uh, as you point out, rightly so, uh, rightly so to, to point out that the trafficking travesties that these folks endure in the incredible stories that we have seen is the revival of how God is touching the lives of, of the Dalit uh, uh, people and especially on the concept of freedom and bringing that they have freedom right. in this man from Galilee, right. Christ Jesus. Right. And that has changed people's lives. Yeah, and, and you, when you go to India, you just see mass baptisms and people coming to Christ. But you also see the flip side of that is persecution, sometimes by the government under anti-conversion laws, mm -hmm. but many times by radical groups, for, you know, radical Hindu groups especially. Mm -hmm. yeah, when I talk pastors over there and help train pastors, I would ask how many of you have been persecuted for the faith? And most of them would raise their hands and they'd all have these incredible stories of how God had worked through persecution to spread the gospel. So it literally is like you're in a time machine, not that you step back into a primitive culture, sure. because as you know, India is very advanced culture, but like you're stepping back in time to that book of Acts when the church is alive and powerful and raw and organic and, and, and really, you know, just opening people's eyes and you see miracles there. It's, it's an amazing thing. For more about the Dalit Freedom Network, check out our website, cwnews.org, for a link. We'll be right back. Our world moves at an incredible pace. People everywhere rushing to their destinations. But there's a destiny that awaits each one of us. And all of us will face life's ultimate question. Where will I spend eternity? In his new DVD, Life Beyond the Grave, Pat Robertson introduces you to real people with remarkable stories of heaven and riveting accounts of hell. You'll learn what the Bible has to say about life after death. The Bible tells us that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Life Beyond the Grave will build your faith as God's promises come alive. 
prepare you to face your eternity and provide you with a powerful witnessing tool to share with your loved ones. I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your destiny is sealed forever in heaven. What touched my heart was when the little boy was able to see his great-grandfather in heaven. It gave me chills. It just gives me goosebumps. <laughs> Make you decide which side of the street you need to walk on. The stories are true. They're real people with real life experiences. Makes you really want to get to heaven. It's beautiful and awe-inspiring and very encouraging. Each and every person should watch this DVD. Life Beyond the Grave, available now. World News, your window to the global church for stories of revival, persecution, relatives and fellow Christians born in the first country over the international day. I'm George Thomas in Baghdad and coming up on the broadcast an exclusive interview and the impact of Christian leaders. Watch Christian World News. Well, have you ever wanted to step back 3,000 years and into the pages of the Bible? Well, now visitors at a new archaeological site in Jerusalem can do just that. Chris Mitchell explains from Israel. For the first time in modern history, this unique ancient site has been open to the public. Beginning today, people will be able to actually walk through First Temple period remains, touch the stones, enjoy and study about yet another period of the archaeology of the city of Jerusalem. 3,000 years ago, stonemasons built these walls to protect the city of Jerusalem. Archaeological evidence indicates that the one who commissioned and oversaw this construction was King Solomon. The reality was that a very highly skilled fortification and a sophisticated fortification uh, was built by King Solomon. And this is only part of it. And it's very impressive. Mm. And, and you saw this wall, huge, uh, stone and so on, and it continues. Archaeologist Elat Mazar uncovered the site called the Ophel, just below Jerusalem's Temple Mount, restored it, and told her story in the book, Discovering the Solomonic Wall in Jerusalem. Mazar believes the Bible refers to this area in the first book of Kings. It says, until he, King Solomon, had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Lots of it is really can be seen and can be touched. And we find lots of stuff that uh, really go directly into the biblical sources. Other tangible examples include this floor that Mazar believes was part of a royal building destroyed in 586 BC when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem. The excavation also exposed the structure called the gatehouse that would have looked like this 3,000 years ago. Jerusalem Mayor Nair Bakat sees the site as not only a great piece of history, but as another way to share the magic of the old city. One of the best investments in the future is exposing our past. It enables people to come and see that it's real, come and visit, and go back home as ambassadors of peace. It shows that the Bible is real. It shows that two and three thousand years ago, Jerusalem was the center of the world. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. Jerusalem. Chris, you get all the good assignments. There's so much amazing history in Israel. Well, that's our report for this week. From all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye and God bless you.